So, good afternoon, everybody. I am Jimena Catepillan, a member of the Undergraduate Student Programming Committee. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lara Padwell, who will deliver the Chan Stanek Lecture. Dr. Padwell earned her Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and her Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science from Valparaiso University in 2003. She earned her PhD in Mathematics from Rutgers University in 2008. She is currently a professor of Mathematics and Statistics at Valparaiso University, and she is the Executive Director of MathPath, a national residential summer camp for middle schoolers who love mathematics. Dr. Padwell is a winner of the MAA's 2014 Alder Award for Distinguished Teaching and the 2023 winner of the Trevor Evans Award, which uh, she received earlier this week here at MathFest for her paper, The Hidden and Surprising Structure of Ordered Lists in Math Horizons. Dr. Padwell has a long history directing undergraduate research projects and is a co-author of a mathematician's practical guide to mentoring undergraduate research. Her presentation is titled Patterns in Permutations. This lecture is sponsored by Citadel and Citadel Securities. Citadel is one of the world's leading alternative investment firms pursuing superior long-term return for the world's preeminent public and private institutions. Lara. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be here. Thank you to all of you for being here. It's a lot more fun to give a talk with an audience. And so I'm really excited to be up here and introduce you to my favorite area of mathematics. Patterns and permutations is an area I've been working in for almost two decades. And what I love about it is its accessibility. What I mean by that is we will need about two definitions to unlock an infinite family of counting problems. I'll show you some of my favorite results, but we'll also get to walk up to the edge of what is known and hear an open question that's been stumping people for a while, but isn't too scary to state. And then we'll get some connections to other areas of science like computer science and chemistry that you might not expect just from taking a familiar definition and looking at it from a new point of view. So let's get started with our title characters of patterns and permutations. I'm gonna start with the second one first though. A permutation, in my mind, is a list where order matters. And every list we look at today will be a list of the numbers one up through n. So I have this slide partly to give that definition and partly to get you used to notation. I'm gonna use this script S sub n for the set of all permutations of length n. So S1, how many ways is there to put one thing in order? Just one, and it's written right up here. S2, how many ways can I put two things in order? Well, there are two ways. Either one comes first or two comes first. And this is to emphasize, don't read this as 12, read this as one, then two or read this other one as two, then one. And we can scale up. There are six ways to put three things in order. And this may be a pattern you're familiar with. One of size one, two of size two, six of size three. How many are you expecting of size four? 24, because the pattern is, if I'm putting these things in order and not repeating anything, I have n choices for what goes first. And now I've used one of my numbers, so I have n minus one things for what goes second, and so on, and the shorthand for this computation is n factorial. Now, when people ask me what I do, and I say I study permutations, one of two things often happens. 
either it's someone who hasn't thought about permutations, and they say, hey, what's that? And I start with this kind of slide. Or they say, oh yeah, permutations, I know that. And factorial, that's all there is to say. Well, we're on slide two of a 30 slide talk, so I have a little bit more to say. I hope that if your perspective on permutations is, oh yeah, I know that, and factorial, this gives you a new angle to look at a familiar definition from. So, instead of just writing permutations as lists of numbers, let me give you more of a picture form. Often, when people are studying permutations, they use pi not to mean the number pi, but to stand for a permutation. So when I say pi in this talk, it stands for a list of numbers, and pi sub 1 is the first number, pi sub 2 is the second number, and so on. And instead of just listing the numbers, I can actually plot a bunch of ordered pairs in the xy plane. In all of these pictures, the origin is down here at the bottom left corner. So for example, let's say I wanted to plot 2, 3, 1 in the xy plane. Pi sub 1 is 2, so I'm going to plot 1, 2 right here to represent that the first digit is 2. Pi sub 2 is 3, so I'm going to plot 2, 3 to represent that 3. And pi sub 3 is 1, so I'm going to plot 3, 1 right here. This is a picture that encapsulates the same information as this list, and you should take a moment and check that visually each of these pictures looks as you expect it to from the list that's below it. I think this is valuable because it gets me thinking from a different angle. If I asked you to take the six permutations of length three on the previous slide and group them by things they had in common, you might put them together based on, say, the first digit or the last digit, but that's not what these pictures tell me to look at. If you look for similar pictures, I would say one, two, three, and three, two, one, their dots form a straight line, whereas the other four have graphs or plots that look more like triangles. And so taking a different point of view on how to represent the information makes me ask different questions. To make sure we've really got this, let me show you one bigger graph. So here's a permutation of length nine. And notice there are nine dots. And the first number is five, I plotted one comma five. The last number is eight, I plotted nine comma eight. This is another picture of an even larger permutation. So if you've got graphs of permutations down, I'm ready to show you the other of two definitions. Nine dots is a lot to look at at once, so maybe let's zoom in and focus on just a handful of them. For example, three of them just turned orange. And if you, in your mind, erase all the columns with black dots and all the rows with black dots, you get a much smaller permutation hiding inside of here. That's what I've done here on the right. All the columns with black dots are gone, all the rows with black dots are gone, and this emphasizes to me that with the orange dots, the smallest orange dot comes first, the largest orange dot comes second, the medium-sized one comes at the end. Well, that's the picture we just drew a slide ago for the graph of 1, 3, 2. So the vocab here is that our big permutation of length 9 contains 1, 3, 2 as a pattern. This is what I mean by pattern. It is a smaller permutation embedded inside of a larger permutation in this very specific way. And again, to emphasize, I didn't have to use the exact numbers 1, 3, 2. This 1, 3, 2 pattern was actually formed by the dots at heights 2, 7, and 4, but it has the same relative shape. I didn't have to take those dots from adjacent columns that can be kind of spread out. The point is these three orange dots, when you just focus on their rows and columns, make a graph of 1, 3, 2. Let's see, there's plenty of other patterns inside of here. For example, those blue four dots are a one, two, three, four. They're not the only one, two, three, four in here. I could have taken these four that are kind of on the southeast rim of the graph. But that doesn't mean every permutation is inside of here. No matter how hard you look, you will not find four dots that make a four, three, two, one shape. So these are all the vocab words we need to get started with some interesting counting and research problems. We have the idea of permutation as something that you can graph in 2D. And when you just look at a subset of the dots in the graph, you can ask what shape do those make? That's a smaller permutation inside of a larger one. And that smaller permutation is called a pattern. But so far, I've been kind of giving you a warm up exercise of here's a big permutation. Let's see what's inside of it. For a research question, we kind of flip which information is given. And so the big research question that's kept people thinking for decades is, what if I don't give you the big permutation? 
what if I give you a specific pattern and then I say, what do bigger and bigger permutations look like if they have to contain that pattern? Or what do bigger and bigger permutations look like if they have to avoid that pattern? So a few comments here. Number one, these questions depend on what pi is. There's a different number of things that avoid 1, 2, 3 than avoid 1, 2, 3, 4. But I also think these are two ways of asking the same question. Because think back to the very first slide, how many total permutations are there of size n? n factorial. And every single one of those either contains pi or avoids pi. And so the answers to these two questions better add up to n factorial. If you can answer one question, you can answer the other. For reasons that we will get to about halfway through the talk, I'm going to always avoid patterns. And some cool things will happen, but it's not just for the sake of cool things. We'll get to historical reasons as well. So I think we're ready to start counting. So let's start small. The smallest permutation I can think of is actually one, but that's not so exciting to contain or avoid because every permutation has a dot. So let's start with avoiding the pattern one, two. How many permutations are there of length one? One, okay, so there's one thing of length one that avoids this. I know there are two permutations of length two, but of those two, how many avoid this pattern? One, right, one, two actually is this pattern, two, one avoids it. I know there are six permutations of length three, how many avoid one, two? One, we have kind of a trend here, you get to say the same thing to every question, that won't be true the whole talk. All right, so out of these six permutations, the first five, I've highlighted a smaller dot followed by a larger dot. That's a one, two pattern. The only thing avoiding one, two here is the decreasing permutation, three, two, one. It is the only thing that doesn't have this kind of shape somewhere inside of it. So what's the pattern here? You kept telling me one and one and one. The decreasing permutation is the only permutation of length n that avoids the pattern one, two. And I could have made a totally separate slide for avoiding 2, 1, but why do you think I didn't? I could have drawn the same pictures and just kind of reflected them over. The increasing permutation is the only thing of, thing of length n avoiding 2, 1. So that's a great warm-up problem. Now we should maybe scale up. We've taken care of all the possible permutations of length 2. Let's try avoiding something of length 3 and see what happens. I've picked one that makes the prettiest pictures. So we're gonna practice avoiding one, three, two. So you help me out again. How many permutations of length one should avoid one, three, two? One, it's still the same answer. How many permutations of length two avoid this? Two, you got to answer something else. Oh, and I jumped a slide ahead. So both permutations of length two avoid this. They're not long enough to have one, three, two inside. When you jump up to length three, we get five things that avoid this because one, three, two is one, three, two. All these other ones don't have a one, three, two inside. And I don't know if you recognize this sequence, one, two, five. I'll give you one more data point here. We know there are 24 permutations of length four and I will highlight where I found the one, three, twos ahead of the talk. So here you see 10 of them I've highlighted a copy of 132. There's a 132, small, large, medium. There's a 132, small, large, medium. And hopefully, even if you don't have an idea why it's 10 contain it versus 14 avoid it, you agree with me, the things in red have 132s inside of them, the things in black do not. So now I'm curious, 1, 2, 5, 14, how many people does that feel familiar to? I see a couple friends raising their hands, and then a couple people might be going, yeah, I have no idea, that's a sequence of numbers. Let me tell you why this makes me excited by thinking about what these 14 pattern avoiding permutations have in common. So I'm gonna draw the picture for you of a 1, 3, 2 avoiding permutation that's much larger than size four. And the first thing I need you to agree with me on is the number n appears somewhere. Maybe it's in the very first column, Maybe it's in the very last column. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle, but this purple dot represents n appears somewhere. So far, so good? Let's think about the dots that appear before the n compared to the dots that appear after the n. I've drawn these boxes here to tell me something about the structure of this permutation. Let's think about what would happen if we had a smaller dot before the n and a larger dot 
after the n, but then you still have the n in the middle, what shape did that just make? You have a one, three, two. So I can't have something smaller in the first part than a dot that's in the later part. All the dots before the n must be larger than all the dots after the n. And as long as I fill in this blue box with something avoiding 1, 3, 2, and I fill in this green box with something avoiding 1, 3, 2, I've made a bigger 1, 3, 2 avoiding permutation. Well, that helps me build a recurrence. So technically, there's one permutation of length 0. You just write nothing down. There's one permutation of length 1. You just write the number 1. And then we can do cases based on the position of n. If n is in the very first column, there are zero things in the blue box and n minus one things in the green box. If n is in the second column, I've got one thing in blue and n minus two things in green. And so I sum across all possible locations of where the largest digit could be and I get this recurrence, which turns out the numbers we've been seeing. And why I get excited is this is a very famous sequence in combinatorics classes called the Catalan numbers. So if we avoid something of length two, we get the all one sequence. If we avoid one, three, two, we actually get a very famous sequence, but it might be new to you. So let me cite a different source on how famous this sequence is. When I meet new data and I'm not sure what sequence it is, my favorite website is this one, the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. It literally has hundreds of thousands of sequences and you can type in a word or you can type in a list of numbers and it will tell you everything it knows about it. In the entry for the Catalan numbers, in this database that specializes in sequences, it says down here, this is probably the longest entry in this whole database that specializes in sequences and rightly so. There is literally a textbook that says here are 200 things counted by the Catalan numbers, figure out why each one works. So what this tells me is counting pattern avoiding permutations is in good company with other classic combinatorics problems. And I'm going to try just two more counting problems with you. If you didn't recognize the Catalan numbers from before, that's, this is a great first place to see them. I have a suspicion you'll recognize our next sequence a little more quickly. So instead of avoiding longer things, let's try avoiding more things. We're going to try to avoid 1, 3, 2, and 2, 3, 1 at the same time, and you get to help me out again. How many things of length one should avoid these? One, because there's only one permutation of length one. How many things of length two should avoid these? Two, because there's two permutations of length two and they're both too short to have these patterns inside them. How many permutations of length three should avoid these? Four, because there are six permutations of length three total, but two of them are these, and so there's four others. And now for length four, I've highlighted things with a 1, 3, 2 in red. I've highlighted things with a 2, 3, 1 in orange. And some things have both, so I marked those in red plus kind of these orange multiple circles. But how many do you see that don't have red or orange? Eight. One, two, four, eight. Is that a recognizable pattern? Let's see if we can figure out what's going on structurally beyond 1, 2, 4, 8. I think I see a pattern. Again, I'm going to focus on the largest dot in the permutation. You might look at these eight that are in black. Where do you see the largest dot? Yeah, I see some motions indicating where the largest dot can be. The largest dot either has to be in the very first column or in the very last column. Why can't it be in the middle? Well, if it's in the middle, you have a dot before it, and you have a dot after it. And that either means that if the dot before it is smaller than the dot after it, you've made the red pattern. If the dot before it is larger than the dot after it, you've made the orange pattern. The largest number has to be at the beginning or the end. And then as long as you recursively fill in this blue box or this green box with something avoiding this pair of patterns, then you've got a larger permutation avoiding this pair of patterns. So it's not an accident we got one, two, four, eight. There really is a doubling thing going on here, starting with one permutation of length one. So avoiding the right strategic pair of patterns, you get powers of two. I've just got one more famous sequence to show you. Let's see if we can figure out why it shows up once we figure out what sequence it is. So we've avoided one pattern of length three, two patterns of length three. My last example is avoiding three patterns of length three at the same time. So you're going to help me out again. How many of length one should avoid these? One. That's a guaranteed answer. How many of length two should avoid these? Two. How many of length three should avoid these? 
three, because again, there are six total permutations of length three. Three of them are these patterns, the other three avoid them. And length four, I've got it colored up in so many colors again. Things that have a one, three, two are in red. Things that have a two, one, three are in blue. Things that have a one, two, three are in olive green. And if they have multiple ones of these patterns, I've taken the first one in the list and colored the permutation that color. And then I've used circles or gray boxes to help highlight additional patterns. But let's think back. We said one, two, three. How many don't have any of these patterns up here? Five. Do we recognize one, two, three, five? What sequence are you hoping for? Fibonacci, but why? What's going on here that's making Fibonacci numbers show up? Well, let's see. Again, I'm going to focus on the largest digit. In the five that don't have any patterns down here, where do you see the largest digit? Yeah, it has to be the first or second column. And let's think about why that is. It has to be in the first or second column, because if it's in the third column or later, there are two things before it. And if those two things before it are in decreasing order, you just made a blue pattern. And if those two things before it are in increasing order, you've just made the olive green pattern. So thanks to the 213 pattern and the 123 pattern, you can't have the largest digit anywhere except the first or second column. Later than that, you're in trouble. But also, if it's in the second column, I know what digit comes first. Because we already talked about what happens when you avoid 132. All the digits before n have to be larger than all the digits after n. So if the second digit is n, the first digit is n minus 1. And now we have a nice recursive structure again. Permutations avoiding this triple of patterns come from either taking something avoiding these of length n minus 1 and putting n on the front, or from taking something that avoids those patterns of length n minus 2 and putting these two digits on the front. And this is why we're getting the Fibonacci numbers. We have the right starting values of one permutation of length 0, one permutation of length 1, and to scale up, we're following this recurrence. So now I'm going to zoom out and give you the big picture of what we've been doing so far. You've met permutations, you've met patterns, and we've done a lot of counting. The four problems we've solved so far are the top four bullets on this slide. We've seen the all one sequence, we've seen the Catalan numbers, we've seen powers of two, and we've seen the Fibonacci numbers. And there's a reason why I kept avoiding more patterns instead of avoiding longer ones. So we saw that if you avoid one, two, you should get the same number of permutations as avoiding two, one, because there's a symmetry there. One, two, and two, one are reflections of each other. For other symmetry reasons, it turns out no matter what permutation of length three you avoid, you get the Catalan numbers. So if you avoid 2, 3, 1, you also get the Catalan numbers. If you avoid 1, 2, 3, it's a little more complicated to explain why, but you get the Catalan numbers. There's lots of symmetry here. What's going on in the last three bullets, I think, is cool for a few reasons. So there are 24 permutations of length 4, but it turns out if you avoid one pattern of length 4, you have to get one of these three sequences. Part of it is because there's a lot of symmetry going on. The number of things avoiding 1, 2, 3, 4 is the same as the number of things avoiding 4, 3, 2, 1. So reversing them or doing other things to their graphs does a lot of symmetry. But here's what else I think is cool. Look at the years on people counting the number of things avoiding 1, 2, 3, 4, or the number of things avoiding 1, 3, 4, 2. While if you're a student, this is before your lifetime, this is during my lifetime. And no matter who you are in the room, Ira Gessel and Miklos Bona are wonderfully friendly mathematicians you can still have a great chat with. This is modern results. And notice what it says here. No one has figured out a non-recursive formula for the number of permutations avoiding 1, 3, 2, 4. And all you need to know to understand that open question is what is a permutation and what is a pattern? We have a recursive formula that's just very slow and only allows us to turn out about 50 terms exactly. But we don't have a non-recursive formula or an efficient recursive formula. The best we have is asymptotic estimates of a lower bound and an upper bound for how fast this grows. And this last bullet here is a big, frequent topic uh, between researchers at current research conferences. So you've made it. 20 minutes into this talk, and you already get an open question that you can ponder. And if you avoid even longer permutations, plenty more open questions. In fact, if you avoid pairs of things of length four, 
the, I think there's three pairs still that no one has a nice formula for yet, for how many avoid this pattern and this pattern simultaneously. So we've gone from the all one sequence, which is a good warm up, to some classy sequences you might recognize from other places, to kind of the cutting edge of enumerative combinatorics research very quickly. This is one reason I love this area. This is what I mean when I call it accessible. Doesn't take a lot of background to get to the edge of what's known and look around. But I also have some other loose ends to go back and address. So earlier in this talk, I said we could talk about containing or avoiding. And I said, I'm going to stick with avoiding. Number one, it gave me pretty sequences, right? But there's a historical reason why I talk about avoiding as well. And that goes back to computer science. So I want to show you where these ideas originally came from instead of just, cool, someone dreamed this up one day. The reason people started talking about pattern avoiding permutations actually goes back to studying sorting algorithms in the 1960s. So I'm guessing you've seen this kind of button before when you work with your favorite spreadsheet program. And you just trust that you can push the button and it will sort your data. But you don't have to think too hard about what the computer is actually doing. There are many ways a computer can sort data. And the model I'm going to describe to you has to do with how you interact with a stack of books. So pretend you've just gone to the library and this pile of books is on your desk. And then wait, you have one more book. If you don't want to make a mess, where do you put the new book? On the top, right? If you like making messes, you might have other strategies. But the clean way to deal with a pile of books is to add things to the top. Or let's say you really need this book that has a black cover and yellow pages partway down the stack. And you want to get it out of the stack without making a mess. What's your strategy? lift things from the top. Because if I just take that corner and yank, I'm likely to make a mess. You have just described the rules of a computer science stack. There are two possible moves. You can take new things and add them to the top. Or you can take things that are in the stack from the top and move them to output. Those are the only two legal moves for this computer science data structure. And math, not mathematicians, computer scientists in the 60s were wondering which permutations can be sorted by running it through a stack. So I'm going to give you an example of we're going to sort 2, 1, 5, 3, 4 by running it through this stack. I represent a stack in this way to remind myself I can only interact with the top. And the output will go down here. And my two choices at any point in time are to either push the first number from input into the stack or to pop the top thing out of the stack and into the end of the output. To get started trying to sort this into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, my first move has to be a push, because there's nothing in the stack at the moment. But now, which makes more sense? Should I push the 1 in or pop the 2 out if I'm going for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Push or pop? OK, I want to push, because if I popped the 2 out, it would come ahead of the 1 in output, and that's not what I'm going for. So I'm going to push the 1 in. What makes sense now, push or pop? Pop, get the one out, because I want it to be at the beginning of my output. What comes next, push or pop? Pop, great. And now I have to push the five in, because the stack was empty. Push or pop? Push the three. Pop the three. Push the four. And now I can pop, pop the four and the five. So this is a sequence of pushes and pops that go from 2, 1, 5, 4, 5, 3, 4 as my input to getting it into completely increasing order as my output. And now here's a question for you to think about for a moment. I managed to sort 2, 1, 5, 3, 4 by just one run through this stack. There are some permutations, I won't tell you which one just yet, that if you try to do this process, no matter how hard you try, your output won't be in increasing order and you'll want another round of this. But if you're only allowed to do one round of pushes and pops through the stack, I'm curious if I give you a minute, if you can find a permutation that can't be sorted after just one run through the stack. I'm literally going to give you a minute to talk with someone at your table or maybe talk to yourself, whichever you like. Start small. What's a small permutation that can't be sorted after one pass through a stack? I'm checking in about 15 seconds. <laughs>
Did anybody find a small permutation that can't be sorted after one run through a stack? Two, three, one. Let's think about what's going on with two, three, one. So you found the smallest one. You matched my slide, which is great. This is two parallel universes going on. Your first move has to be to push the two because there was nothing in the stack. But in the first row, we're going to consider what happens if you try to push next. And in the second row, we'll consider what happens if you try to pop next. So if you push the three on top of the two, what's the problem there? That means three will be ahead of two in output, and that's not what we're going for. On the other hand, if you pop the two out, your problem is the two is ahead of the one in output. So it turns out you cannot sort two, three, one after just one run through a stack. You'd need to do the process multiple times. That's the smallest permutation that has this problem. But you can maybe even see how having two, three, one as a pattern would be an issue. Because if you have a medium, then large, then small set of three digits spread out in your permutation, you're going to run into the same issue. Do I take the medium thing out before the large thing gets there, or do I leave it? And it turns out, this is the classic theorem that got pattern-avoiding permutations started. In the classic computer science book, The Art of Computer Programming, Donald Knuth showed that a permutation is sortable after exactly one run through a stack, if and only if it avoids 2, 3, 1. And you've already seen kind of one direction of this if and only if. We've seen on the previous slide what's wrong with 2, 3, 1. Let's think about something that avoids 2, 3, 1. It's a very similar picture to something we drew earlier. Here's the largest digit, and everything before it has to be smaller than everything that comes after it. If you recursively fill in this blue box with something that avoids 2, 3, 1, and this green box with something that avoids 2, 3, 1, and write an induction proof where that you assume permutations of length at most n minus 1 that avoid 2, 3, 1 can be sorted, you can think about what will happen now. By the induction hypothesis, this little permutation in blue will go in the stack and come out in sorted order. Then the largest digit will just go sit in the bottom of the stack, while by the induction hypothesis, the stuff in green will go in the stack, come out in sorted order, and then you can put your purple dot at the end. So this is really the first place that this language of patterns and permutations got used. It wasn't the mathematicians. It was Donald Knuth analyzing sorting algorithms. But about 15 years later, mathematicians see this result and say avoiding 2, 3, 1 was useful in this other discipline. But what's so special about 2, 3, 1? What happens if we take that definition and avoid other patterns? And then you have this whole 40-year-old research field of pattern-avoiding permutations that you got a taste of at the beginning. So computer science inspired mathematics. We got a lot of beautiful counting to consider. It goes the other direction as well. And for the end of the talk, I'd like to show you my favorite, more recent result of solving a permutation patterns problem that's connected to another discipline in perhaps a very surprising way. But to do that, we're going to switch gears again. And instead of avoiding, we're going to start thinking about pattern containment. So let's see. We've talked about avoiding 1, 2. We said that there is one permutation of length 3 avoiding 1, 2. Therefore, how many permutations of length 3 contain 1, 2? Five, right? There's six total. One avoids it. The other five contain it. Notice that there's more nuance here. Avoid is a yes or no question. For containment, I can say how many times does a permutation contain my pattern. So here are these six graphs of permutations of length three. Here's the one thing that avoids one, two. But notice that these two, there's only one specific pair of dots you could pick that make a one, two pattern. These ones, there's two different pairs of dots that you could pick that make a one, two pattern. And this one here has the most copies of 1, 2 of all, because you could pick any of the three pairs of dots and get a 1, 2 pattern. So one direction that pattern containment research goes is you ask this optimization problem of, I have a pattern. What is the most number of copies of it that I could get into a larger permutation? Now, to make it just a little more fun, I'm going to give you one more definition. Instead of talking about just any permutation, we're going to talk about alternating permutations. So an alternating permutation is one where the first number is smaller than the second, the second number is larger than the third, back and forth, back and forth. And when I talk about things like this to my brother, he goes, but what about the ones that start with a decrease? Some authors call those alternating too. These will get the job done for us today. 
So to check this definition, here are the five alternating permutations of length four. Notice, for example, one is less than four, four is bigger than two, two is less than three. And here's the counting question I want to end on today. What is the largest possible number of one, two, three patterns you can get in a permutation if it's alternating? As a warm up, just take a look at these five of length four. These are all alternating. Which one of these has the most one, two, three patterns inside of it? That makes it a multiple choice question. <laughs> I mean, we can check here. How many one, two, threes are in this one? Zero, there's no way to pick three numbers that are all in increasing order. What about this one? Zero, okay, so these last two are out of the running. How many one, two, three patterns are here? One, two, three, four makes a one, two, three pattern. How many one, two, threes are in here? One, one, two, three is a one, two, three pattern. And how many one, two, three patterns are in here? Two, right, you, can, you have to take the one, you have to take the four, but you could choose either of the other two digits as the middle of your one, two, three. I'm gonna give you another minute. What's the most one, two, threes you can get in an alternating permutation of length five? In a minute, I'll check, but I want you to have the head start on thinking about it before you see the next slide. And check in about 15 seconds again. So I hope you're thinking about alternating permutations of length five. How many one, two, threes did you get in your alternating permutation of length five? Could you get more than two? Because two is what we got for length four. Okay, three, did anybody get more than three? I heard four, did anybody get more than four? Okay, I get four as well, because I drew the first five dots of this picture, and let's make sure we understand why there's four copies here. Ignore the top three dots here, I drew an even bigger one. But if you draw one, three, two, five, four, notice that you can get a one, two, three by starting with this dot and then taking either of these and then taking either of these. So two choices here, two choices here. That's an alternating permutation with four copies of one, two, three. And in fact, if you want to extend the pattern, you just kind of keep doing this. Whenever you have to go uphill, make a new highest digit of all. And whenever you have to go down, go down as little as possible. Well, how many one, two, threes are inside of this? I'm gonna have to do a lot of casework. And I'll point out the casework, but what's more interesting is the numbers that are coming out. Two in something of length four, four in something of length five. The casework is gonna depend on whether you're looking at an even length or odd length permutation, because that makes a difference on whether you have one dot all by itself at the top versus a pair at the top. And then I'm doing some casework based on where the one, two, three comes from. In the odd case, either I use this dot that's by itself or I don't. And in the even case, I can use zero, one, or both of these singleton dots at the end. So don't think too hard about this. This is really just all the casework. Focus on the numbers that come out of it. These are all even numbers. You even have a hint at the top in my kind of table of contents of where you might see these numbers. They actually show up somewhere really cool. But I don't expect you know chemistry sequences so much. So where would you go if you were a mathematician who likes to count and has a new sequence of numbers? You'd go to the OEIS. So when I punch in some of this data, the first hit that comes up has no math whatsoever. It just says atomic numbers of the alkaline earth metals, whatever that means, however long chemistry was ago for you. Notice there's no formula here, but often the OEIS comes up with multiple entries for the same data Here's another hit it gives for this data. It still has a description in terms of atomic numbers of alkaline earth metals, whatever that means. This does actually have some math going on. This minus one to the end tells me the odd versus even really does make a difference. 
what is going on here? Why am I getting chemistry words when I'm counting one, two, threes inside of alternating permutations? Well, maybe for a moment, store 4, 12, 20, 38 in your head. Got it? Where do you see them in this picture? We're getting the numbers in the second column here. And the first time I saw this, I just said, wow, what in the world is going on? Well, here's my high school level of understanding of what's going on in the periodic table. The numbers that you see in these boxes are the number of protons you would expect in the nucleus of an atom of one of these elements. Therefore, it's the number of electrons floating around the outside. Why are the rows and columns arranged as they are? Well, that has to do with how electrons fill up the space outside the nucleus of your atom. Electrons kind of live in layers. There's an innermost layer that has a capacity of two, then a next layer that has a capacity of eight, and so on. Column 18 is the elements that their outermost layer is completely full. Column one is they have a bunch of full layers of electrons plus one bonus one ready to get involved in a reaction. So we're really getting atomic numbers of elements that have two bonus electrons in their outermost layer. So I went to some chemistry PhD friends and said, why do the rows grow as they do? Why is it 2, 8, 8, 18? I need to know. The first one I asked said, that's just the way it is, which made me sad. <laughs> but then I thought, if you asked me an analysis question, I might have that reaction as a combinatorialist because I'm out of practice, right? Chemists have specialties just like mathematicians. So I found a chemist with a different specialty who said it has to do with Schrodinger's wave equation. And I said, oh man, that sounds continuous and I'm doing discrete math. But then she lent me a physical chemistry book and it does have to do with Schrodinger's wave equation. But the way chemists talk about Schrodinger's wave equation is they parameterize the solutions to it with tuples of integers that describe the likely locations of electrons in your atom. So for each of those elements in the periodic table, you can take each of the little electrons in the atom and associate an N, L, M, and spin number with it. And the N number coincides with my high school understanding that electrons live in shells. N equals one are the electrons closest to the nucleus. N equals two are a little further out and so on. But then you get some more nuance. The electrons that live closest to the nucleus all live in kind of a sphere shape around the nucleus. But if you get an L equals one kind of electron, it lives in a figure eight kind of shape. And then once you start getting more interesting shapes than spheres for where your electron is moving, you can orient these different ways. For example, an L equals one kind of orbital of an electron can be oriented on the X, Y, or Z axis. And so it's more detail than fits in five minutes, but I can point you to a reference if you're interested. You can take the quantum numbers that chemists use to describe electrons in that second column of the periodic table and use them as kind of coordinates to describe where the one, two, threes are in that alternating permutation with the most one, two, threes possible. I think this is amazing. And so I'm really excited to share it with even more people. But I wanna zoom out slightly more to wrap up the talk. You've come along with me for a lot of different topics in this 45 minutes. I introduced to you a kind of a pure math counting problem, which is what I love to do. But we've also seen its roots in computer science and you've seen a much newer connection to electrons, turns out people use pattern avoiding permutations to talk about biological things like how DNA and RNA act. There's a whole branch of algebraic geometry where there's these geometric objects and each of them has a permutation as its name tag. And if you say which geometric objects have this property, it turns out to be the ones whose permutation name avoids a certain pattern. So pattern avoiding permutations tell us things in certain areas of geometry. There's even people who study infinitely long permutations and patterns in those, which tell them something about statistical mechanics and particle physics. I think this is wild. But even if you're a theoretical mathematician like me, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you came in here thinking permutation, cool, n factorial, that's it. Really, look at it from different angles and you get so much more to do. This is from a different database called FindStat that has over 300 different features of permutations you might study. We talked about copies of one, two, three. We talked about stack sorting. There are hundreds of other features of permutations that open up doors to interesting mathematics. So I hope you've enjoyed this journey through my favorite area of combinatorics. If you wanna learn more, there are my key references. The slides are already on my website, so that's really all you need. And thanks for listening. So we 
have, we have time for some questions. And there are two microphones, one on each side. Yes, I'll start. Um, so this is about the chemistry table you had. Um, what about the other columns? So Can the other columns are going to grow at the same speed as that first column, right? The differences are the same. And so I could contrive something like, say, let's look at alternating permutations, but where you have to use this particular digit. So there's no natural way to get anything else there from other avoiding patterns? At least not, nothing obvious. Okay. So what comes naturally from the question I posed is that sequence that matches up with the second column. But what's interesting here is the differences happen the same. And so you, with any column of the periodic table, you're going to have the same differences as you read down the column. Mm -hmm. And so getting those differences is the interesting part. You would have to put an extra condition to make another column appear. Did that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Well, let's thank Lara. <laughs> this is wonderful.